Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's Contract Administration Practice Community. At this point, I do want to hand it over to Jim to get started with today's topic. So, Jim, over to you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, everyone, welcome. Glad to have you today. Uh, Doug Freeman is, as we speak, in a state agency inspection on a project, so he's going to join us if, if and when they finish, and he can. Uh, but Matthew, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, what we're talking about today is the first part of Chapter 8, which is interpretations. And if you go to the next slide, uh, we all know that interpretations on our projects are the nature of the beast. Um, of course, there's no substitute for the best documents that we can produce that are clear and concise and accurate, uh, correct, complete. But none of us are perfect, and there hasn't been yet, I don't guess, the perfect set of documents created. Certainly hasn't been a perfect set created by me or any of the folks I work with. And so in that regard, we're called on as the architects or the engineers to interpret, to clarify, uh, to uh, do any of those things that are necessary to modify the documents if there's missing information during the construction phase. So it's really important for us to have a orderly process, uh, procedure, uh, to make those interpretations or clarifications uh, or uh, modifications. So uh, of course, when we get into the modifications, and, and we'll talk about that in the second half uh, in our next session in January, but those are either ones that uh, change the cost and or time and ones that don't, and we'll go into that later. But Matthew, let's go to the next slide and talk about interpretations um, and interpreting the documents. So really what we know is that the, the answers are there uh, with the questions as we move through the construction phase. At least we certainly have hoped to put the documents together so that the answers are there with the questions. And when we coordinate our documents well, then the potential for conflicts or potential for any needed interpretations or modifications is reduced. And we talked about that uh, last month in Chapter 7. Um, our documents, uh, you know, I, I talk about this a lot with folks that I work with, uh, that we're we're not really in uh, a beauty contest. Uh, what we're trying to do is be sure that the information is clear and that it's stated well so that it can be followed. So whether your documents are something lovely to gaze at uh, or whether they are not is not the point. We need to be clear and we need to only be doing it once. Um, they don't need to be uh, competitive, our drawings and our specifications, for example. They need to complement each other. And as time has shown us, often when we have information in more than one place, then we have uh, sadly an additional opportunity to have uh, a crack in the sidewalk, uh, a missed plank in the walkway, and an opportunity for uh, a modification to be necessary or an issue to arise. So when, when we do have the need for interpretations, when we do have information that we need to uh, provide, uh, both our uh, AIA documents and EJCDC documents uh, require that we do that in a way that we are impartial and that we are fair. And uh, I want to go to the next slide uh, to look at the uh, examples of the construction documents, uh, for the, I'm sorry, for the general conditions that we're going to refer to. But I'll pause for a second and see if there are any questions at this point. Matthew, any hands in the air? Uh, not yet. Everybody is still kind of getting into the swing of things. OK, cool. So. The AIA document A201 and the EJCDC document C700 uh, both uh, talk about the relationship of the documents uh, and how they are complementary and that what is shown in one of those documents 
uh, is binding as if it were shown in all those documents. And we start with this conversation because I think uh, my experience has been that frequently uh, the requests for interpretation, uh, any kind of uh, ask for uh, additional information uh, is often found in this area where, well, we see it over here, but we don't see it over there. Um, we use our construction contracts that we often help the owner with uh, to explain that this project is described by the contract documents. And those documents include many pieces. Uh, the contracting forms themselves, all of the conditions to the contracts that are signed, of course, our drawings and specifications, addenda, modifications that uh, are, go along with that. So it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a group of things, not any one thing. And so our general conditions and uh, the EJCDC general conditions uh, the AIA general conditions go a long ways to try to describe that all of these parts go together. Uh, and then in those cases where uh, information may not be as apparent uh, as it could be, uh, then the architect or the engineer steps forward to render some professional judgment uh, in trying to describe what it is uh, that is required. So we consider at those times the drawings and the specifications together uh, and we look for uh, and try to share what it is that was our intent. As a designer, we had an intent for a scope of work. Uh, that scope of work should be reasonably inferable. Uh, and that's a key uh, phrase, a key term. Uh, in the contract document uh, arbitration, mediation, litigation field where uh, you will perhaps be asked if you found yourself there, was this information reasonably inferable within the documents? And this is where our fair and impartial judgment comes in. Uh, and Matthew, if you'll go to the next slide, you know, we're now at the cusp of rendering uh, professional judgment, but in doing so, we have to remember that our role is to be fair and impartial. Uh, we're on the fence. We are not, even though we are under contract with our client, with the owner, we are not to be leaning to one side or the other between the owner and the contractor. Uh, I will tell you that those opportunities, uh, are not what I would refer to them most of the time, but those opportunities are some of the most difficult times that I've had as a professional where uh, I had to say to the owner, well, no, uh, this is not reasonably uh, inferable. It's, uh, it's not in the contract documents uh, or even worse still, uh, there is an error and an omission here that clearly was not inferable and we need to go to the next steps of making a, a modification in the project. Again, I apologize for having to split these uh, two up because they do go hand in hand, uh, but we'll certainly in January talk about what those opportunities may mean when we have to uh, proceed with a modification. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide and um, talk about these requests for interpretations. Uh, I don't know uh, if many of you uh, know that uh, CSI has historically uh, referred to uh, the RFI, if you will, as a request for interpretation because that is the uh, explaining of something that is already there uh, in a more detailed way in which uh, it might be understood versus what the AIA has historically done is referred to this as a request for information where that might be something that is uh, a fact or a detail about a subject that wasn't known before. 
Uh, so this may seem like a slight difference, but for our two organizations, it's been uh, very seriously studied and uh, the uh, process of deciding requests for interpretations was better uh, for the architect and the engineer side of the equation uh, was not a decision made by accident. So for the time being, as we talk about this, uh, I'll refer to the RFI as a request for interpretation. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide, and you can see there an example of a CSI form uh, that uh, is within uh, Chapter 8 of the book, uh, the Practice Guide. And uh, I'll stop for a second before I talk about this any and see, Matthew, if there are any questions so far. Yeah, there's one question that came in here from Hassan. He's asking, how are the interpretations and the new conditions placed in the revised A201 affect as we move forward? Now, will you, will you ask me that again? Sure. How are the interpretations and the new conditions placed in the revised A201 affect as we move forward? So I think he's asking whether or not the changes that happened in the A201 for 2017, how that might affect um, previous practices or information moving forward. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that uh, at this time. Uh, I have not, um, haven't, haven't used the uh, new documents myself personally in a CA format. So uh, I don't know. And uh, if you, uh, I'm sorry I didn't hear who asked that question, but if you have some information that uh, you might be able to toss in here for us to uh, bat around, that would be great. Uh, I just don't know. Were there uh, any others? Matthew, any other questions? No, at this time, everyone else is still quiet. Okay. Well, so well, let's take a look here and see what, you know, what, what is an RFI? Well, typically, uh, that request comes from a construction manager, a, a contractor, or owner. And, and it, it's shocking for some to hear that owners, too, may uh, issue a request for interpretation. but uh, that that does happen, and it's where they are seeking uh, information um, as a clarification of the contract documents, as is defined in master spec. These are something that are uh, that are a process to receive interpretation of documents. They could be a request for information if there is something missing, but again, uh, CSI refers to the term interpretations. Uh, and so in the practice guide, there is a, def a definition that includes also the word information, but that tends to lean towards the direction of perhaps a future uh, modification associated with the project. And you can see there uh, where in the practice guide that information is noted. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And uh, you can see the difference in the AIA document, which refers to the RFI as information, not interpretation. Um, and I put that in there as an example of what that form may look like. We, we've talked about this in the past. And I'll just pause for a second to remind everyone that as you perform your construction administration services, there are throughout the, the, the phase of construction some um, opportunities, I'll use that word, for forms, for standards. This is what we use uh, when we have a request for interpretation. This is what we use when we uh, issue information that is not in the contract documents. This is what we use when we do a site observation. Uh, this is what we use when we don't do a site observation, but we drop material off at a site. If you can standardize forms in your firm and 
stick with the use of those forms if you do standardize your forms. Uh, it certainly makes for an organized project and one that has clear communication between the parties. So uh, that, that's another uh, reason for having these examples in the show today. Um, so we've talked about interpretations. What what is it? Uh, is uh, there's there's information that is being requested for the project. So what that that's important to know. What though is an RFI not? And uh, as you see this list here, uh, these are things that in the past um, a request for interpretation uh, perhaps has tried to be. Uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so it is not uh, to request the approval of a submittal, although you may have received RFIs in the past that uh, came attached to a submittal or perhaps even a substitution request. Well, those have forms. Uh, you may have in your firm a standard submittal uh, transmittal or a submittal review form. You may have substitution request forms. Uh, so stick with those and realize that if an RFI comes in like that, uh, that that's not what the RFI process is about, uh, nor is it for the contractor to receive some approval of their intended means or methods uh, around a certain procedure or some corrective action that they are deciding to take that uh, that might be important to the project. Um, and it is not a request for coordination information or anything else that is already within the contract documents. So th it's not to request time changes or it's not to modify contract sums. Uh, it's not to uh, ask for some sort of a change of action on a submittal that you have taken action on. Uh, these are not documents that are contract documents, so they don't change the contract document requirements. And I, well, I go through this list because often it's important to know what things are not just as important as knowing what those things are. And we'll talk a little later about some signs of perhaps concern uh, related to this list of what requests for interpretations are not. So uh, let's go to the next slide, Matthew, and uh, take a look at some things that are, are really helpful to your communication pathway on the project. Um, so establishing early procedures centered around uh, RFIs and how those are going to be managed uh, certainly make working as a team much easier. We've talked in pre-construction and we've talked in uh, site observation and we've talked in meetings these previous chapters about uh, establishing processes and procedures early in the project and then sticking with those uh, establishing an expectation of others to stick with those and you within your organizations yourself sticking with those uh, uh, to show the team that you intend to do your part uh, certainly makes for a better working atmosphere. Um, these, as we've talked about, the request for interpretation uh, allow the contractor and or the owner to inquire about things that maybe seemed insufficiently described to them. Uh, they are not changing the contract document, but simply asking for uh, a response as to whether they are interpreting what we showed them uh, correctly. And then it allows us as the architect or engineer to respond to that and say, yes, you, you understood it right. Um, the information is here, here, and here that you need to put that system together. Or it may uh, lead us to the discovery that we, in fact, uh, have some information that's missing and that there is an adjustment, either a minor change or something that is significant that will change the contract sum or time uh, moving forward in the project. So 
Uh, let's take a look at the next slide as another example of a form that might be uh, beneficial to us in the process of CA. And I'll pause for a second and see if there are any hands up right now, Matthew. Um, Hassan just gave some additional content related to his uh, original question. Uh, so he indicated in the revised A201 has provisions for hazardous material management and waste management on the site. And while the conditions are not necessarily project specific, but are expected contractors' behavior um, and site management issues. So is this an owner um, or architect design team issues to seek consent or approval um, of site conditions being performed by the contractor? Well, that's a, you know, um, I'll give you a, a, a quick thought first pass is that anything related to hazardous materials, uh, there are certainly parties involved uh, beyond any firm I've worked with that have been consultants either with the owner or with the contractor uh, in dealing with uh, anything related to that. Uh, so uh, examples of engineering firms that specialize in hazardous materials or hazardous material mitigation um, in the projects I've been associated with, that has been through the owner. Um, often, uh, and in the case of my firm, um, my liability insurance carrier forbid uh, our involvement with anything associated with that. And uh, so if you're fortunate and know up front uh, with your owner, then you can be clear about contracting with that and that responsibility fell completely with them. There are those times though where you stumble upon it uh, during the process and again in my experience uh, that has been something that the owner undertook uh, separate of my services as a construction administrator and brought in other professionals who were focused on dealing with those kind of issues uh, themselves. Most of those have been engineering uh, type firms and, um, you know, and, and in some cases, uh, our part of the work just was uh, paused. Uh, I hesitate to use the word stopped, but we paused to step back and let that uh, mitigation, for example, occur uh, until that hazardous issue was out of the way and we came back uh, into the project. I guess very similar to uh, any other testing that may go on for uh, other types of uh, construction, whether it's structural steel connections or um, uh, soil, subsoil uh, verifications, that sort of thing. So it, it went on while we were a part of the project, but we were not in responsible charge of it. And I don't know if that uh, answers the question at all, but um, if that didn't, please raise your hand again and let Matthew uh, know more and we'll delve into it. Any others, Matthew? No, everything else is still quiet. Okay. Well, uh, this, this is yet another example as I've touched on forms for the firm and what you may use another CSI standardized form that uh, allows you to provide clarification. So uh, it's important um, that you use documents that your firm uh, has set up to, uh, to be the basis of service provided. If you do have those forms and they are institutionalized in your organization, Doug has often reminded us that then we better use them. Uh, or we better have really good reasons for not using them. Uh, so it's important to stick by our own standards. But in the use of these firms, if you look at the language um, and you were able to go into the practice guide uh, where you find this form, in addition to the information you give, it gives you some uh, coverage of what the intention is as a firm of your use of this form. So let me say that a different way. 
here's a clarification notice, uh, Ms. Contractor, and I want to be sure you see this part of the form that says this is a clarification. This is not additional work. This is clarification, and you may proceed based on the original contract documents because it was within that document, and we are not changing anything with this form. So there's some language there in some of these and the different professional organizations that help us uh, in providing our service. And, you know, to, to begin, the contractor is responsible for letting us know if there's anything that's missing, that's inconsistent. Again, remember, we're being impartial and fair as we go through the contract documents to say, yes, uh, this is in there, and you can go ahead and fabricate and install what was originally in the contract documents, or conversely, no, you're right, this was inconsistent, we need to give you some more information, and uh, there may have been a discrepancy, we want to get that cleared up. We're not going to do that here, we're going to do that on the other appropriate forms that we use uh, in our provision of CA services. One of the most important things for us to talk about, and if anybody has experience with this that wants to raise their hand and is willing to share or uh, would like to give us any details, when we are handling during construction requests for interpretations, RFIs, um, time is of the essence. And it is critically important that if we have included in our general conditions for the project a statement like this, we will reply to RFIs within five business days and we will return shop drawings and submittals within 10 business days. Just pretend that we said that for a second, then we better do it. Or we better change the time, or we better take it out of our general conditions. Timeliness is critical during construction. There are so many variables uh, occurring during the construction phase that it is really important for us to be clear, concise, fair and timely. So my question uh, for anyone that would like to share is uh, when you have these requests for interpretation, the general contractor maintains that information on a log and, and we'll close today looking at one of those logs. Um, have you had experiences where RFIs became the central issue of debate, uh, mediation, litigation, where there were pages and pages of RFIs with dates that they were issued and lack of dates that they were returned? Um, as you ponder that question, let's go to the next slide and We'll talk a little more about who initiates them and then the one after that uh, about some, the ones after that about some warning signs. So again, the question is, what have you, have you had experience where RFIs uh, came back to be a problem uh, or were an issue on your job? And if you feel up to it and you'd like to share that, uh, I'd love to hear um, anyone that's willing to share. Matthew, just interrupt me anytime that you get a hand up in the air about that. Um, so we've talked about who initiates these. Typically from the construction side, uh, construction manager, uh, not so frequently from the owner. Uh, again, the communication is key, but not just timely communication, but proper uh, connection of that communication. Who sends in the RFIs? Well, it's important that they come from the contractor, from one source. Uh, you should not be receiving these from subcontractors or suppliers. If you do, 
provide them to the contractor and request that they come through them. They must originate with the contractor, single source. You do not want to be uh, communicating outside those proper lines of contract. And of course, conversely for us on the architecture or engineering side, we don't want our consultants um, directly replying to those RFIs. So, you know, it, it it's not infrequent that we see, uh, for example, steel detailers, uh, perhaps because we've allowed it, because it's quicker and easier and doesn't take our time, uh, that they would be sending RFIs to the structural engineer and vice versa back and forth to get quick answers and get steel fabricated and on a site. That's not the way that the contract documents and our general conditions define that this process works. Uh, all of that information should flow through the architect or engineer, the primary contract holder, um, so that you are aware, we are aware of the status of questions on the job, of the kind of answers, and um, quite frankly, whether there are uh, discrepancies or errors and, or omissions that we should be aware of. Um, so those procedures are should be very clear, very easy to follow, and they are right in Division One uh, and should be uh, a central focus of the pre-construction conference to go into great detail about that communication and that communication path. And uh, we've, we've talked about standardized forms uh, and I just can't express enough about getting one that works for your firm and implementing that as a process. And as you move through the RFI, you, you know that there are those occasions where uh, they do turn into uh, an omission, uh, discrepancy, an error that needs to be addressed, or there's been a change in a product, something that needs to be done. And so that might move it from a request for interpretation to an issue where we want to ask for a request for proposal. Different form, different process, different procedure, we see there's something missing here. Ms. Contractor, we want to come to you with a request for proposal because we see there's information missing here. This is what we would like to explain and we would like to have a proposal from you uh, on how to provide that particular product or piece of our project. So when it becomes necessary, be sure to step back, uh, step out of the RFI, uh, process and step into the appropriate process to conclude that question uh, for your project. So, uh, Matthew, let's go to the next slide. And any anybody willing to share any dirty laundry yet? Uh, we have a, a couple of things that have come in, actually. Uh, so one of them okay. here. Uh, from Marcy saying, uh, not question, no question, just FYI in response to your RFI question. Uh, I haven't had any actual litigation, but the due dates are an issue. Contractor is using Procore and puts his deadlines on them, which do not match the contract. I've requested they follow the contract, but no changes yet. We strictly maintain our own logs to mitigate the risk of appearing late in our response. And actually, around the same time, Mark came in with a comment saying, the problem with returning submittals within 10 business days uh, from the date submitted by the contractor is that by the time it gets to a consultant who will be reviewing the submittal, it's, um, it is that the consultant may only have a couple of days to review. That's right. They're both great points. Uh, first, I would say uh, that absolutely we get these pieces of information that have arbitrary deadlines uh, the contract that the contractor signed, your contract documents and general conditions establish uh, dates, then I think it's worth a detailed and difficult conversation to get that date changed on the form. Or, as you have tried to do, if they refuse to do that, strike through what they wrote, put your timeline down that's the contract that the contractor signed, 
initially, date it, and send it back because the, the, the action that you take in correcting their error can be presented that way if ever it came to that. Um, and I think you're right also about the number of days. Uh, I, I've done projects in, in differing ways, some that had number of business days listed, some that had number of calendar days listed, some that had uh, words like uh, as appropriate to the sequence of construction. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that we can get in trouble uh, in so many different ways, either as contractors or as designers. Uh, you know, there's, there's probably no exact right answer. Um, except to say that it is uh, incumbent on us as professionals to meet the deadlines that we author in our specifications. Um, you know, I, I've had pre-construction conferences where, and again, those are not contract documents, so you have to be careful with this, but we've, we've put uh, schedules in our general conditions and we sat down and at pre-constructions decided we're going to agree to these dates. That's not a hard contract document, but it's an agreement that everybody, uh, you know, reached in a meeting and the minutes are distributed and then you keep your fingers crossed and hope for the best. Um, I don't like that method. Uh, I like having the hard dates that we stick to. But, you know, in creating those dates, it's a good idea to be sure that your team um, can commit to those same dates, if that's at all possible. It's a good point that our consultants end up with not enough time sometimes, and we need to take them into consideration. Um, any others, Matthew? Yeah, there's another question that came in here. Um, in the new environment with CMs and design build contracts, uh, with owners having multiple contracts without interlock interlocking them, uh, the GC is not always obligated as the single source of questions. How is that addressed? Well, that's a great point. And uh, the answer is it's not addressed well in this edition of the practice guide. I can tell you that the next edition of the practice guide is in process and the project delivery method is in fact impacting uh, what information is in that practice guide. I don't know off the top of my head exactly how it's addressed, but I do know one of the things that is a part of the new edition is the comparing of different contract organizations and how language may change in those contracts. So, for example, as you just described, if there is a construction delivery method that's different and there's a contract for construction manager at risk, then within the uh, RFI section, there may be a comparison between those organizations. Uh, it, it is very different. Uh, often the, the, the processing of, R, of RFIs moves up in the sequence, like submittals, and it may be that information moves back and forth between parties uh, that are what we would think are subcontractors now. So if the project has been packaged, then what, what I just said about not corresponding with a uh, subcontractor may be changed uh, because you have to uh, because of the sequencing of the construction. So it, that's a really valid and good uh, comment that there, the delivery method affects much of this, as does the contract that you sign. So uh, it could be that the practice guide uh, is uh, a is not focused on the delivery method uh, because most of this first edition was centered around design, bid, build. And that will change. That will change. Any others, Matthew? Uh, no, I think you're good to go. Okay. 
Well, we touched on this. Uh, often RFIs are misused, and uh, as one of the examples we just talked about, they are often used to create this illusion of negligence. Uh, I've started jobs. My my experience has been that you know, we go to a pre-construction meeting and the contractor walks in with 25 RFIs with the same date, due date on them and uh, 15 submittal packages and they throw it down on the table and say, we need all this by next week. Um, so, you know, there, there, there are occasions where the things that we're talking about here today are just impossible. Uh, parties can't agree and, and it happens sometimes. But, you know, it, it, they should be limited, these RFIs, to a certain scope of questions. And if you're getting demands for immediate answers and uh, RFI after RFI after RFI, then Another thing that you may be thinking about and starting to deal with is what this is going to be like down the road so that you, and, and I hate to put it this way, but so you begin to build your case of defense um, because it appears obvious what's going on here is not uh, going to end well. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with preparing early uh, and looking at that. And then if you don't have to use it, great. Um, but you have to be clear and straightforward as you move through uh, in acting as a professional. And, and I think if you stick with that, uh, that's the best that all of us can do. If the contractor is doing their job and they're complying uh, with the general conditions in the contract, then that will go well too because they're asking sufficiently in advance and, and shouldn't have a time issue or a problem uh, as they move forward. Um, so uh, if you go to the next slide, these are all continuations of conversations of abuse. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide, Matthew. And, you know, there, th this may be a process where they're trying to insinuate omissions, uh, and that's not valid. Uh, it may be, uh, you know, that they're trying to question the design intent, uh, and that perhaps you don't have a complete set of uh, information. Um, when we're using standardized documents like AIA 201, they anticipate these uh, types of questions and have language about what it is that we um, were doing with our construction documents. Uh, so, uh, standardized documents, big plus when uh, you're using those because uh, these things have been contemplated and hopefully addressed. Um, so, uh, I want to try to uh, get to uh, the next page, Matthew, because this, this whole abuse of RFIs is beginning to lead into and lean towards uh, what may be becoming a dispute uh, area within a project and uh, may start to look like claims situations uh, because this RFI process has perhaps gotten out of hand. This is looking at the worst case scenario. So um, I apologize for taking that position, but I think if we're prepared for that, then we are uh, best prepared overall. Um, and should these uh, RFIs lead into claims? Uh, well, there are uh, maybe disagreements over specific interpretations that we've made. Um, those can be minimized. Effective communication, I think, is our very best tool having appropriate general conditions, having appropriate instructions at the beginning of the project with the appropriate parties, and then communicating effectively and on time should reduce any claims that may potentially be coming out of uh, these requests for interpretation. Because if we're, if we're not timely with our response, then those 
those things that start to be claims end up becoming disputes. And then we move into a whole different realm of uh, resolution to disputes that start with a lot of homework in the documentation of what our interpretations were, what our conversations and decisions were, um, certainly going through the complete understanding that all parties had about their obligations to the contract and what their rights are. Um, e even as we move through these points of dispute, uh, acknowledging that it is occurring uh, is important. So we, we've done our best. We've been professional. We've been fair and impartial. We've done all the things right that we think we can, uh, and we still are moving towards a dispute. Then it's important to be, again, professional, impartial, and fair and coming to a resolution as promptly as we can. Uh, my experience has been that time is not a good thing uh, when you spend more of it in the dispute itself. Um, resolution is the goal, and timely resolution uh, is uh, much better than letting these issues sit uh, unresolved. So what, what do we do? We listen carefully. Um, we communicate effectively. We look for mutual benefits. Um, and if we need it and we're not good at it, we bring someone in that can help us uh, to mediate, uh, to arbitrate. I use those words not necessarily connected with the organizations that do that but just as a means of resolution. So I'll give you a quick example uh, of something that started as a request for interpretation and ended in a claim that turned into a dispute that was resolved um, with no money being spent, nobody being angry or mad, nobody being in court. Um, so. I was working on a project that had a uh, brick veneer elevation, and that elevation had been drawn in great detail uh, on uh, the elevation drawings, and it had been drawn in greater detail uh, in some sections, and it used more than one brick type, and the brick type got reversed. Uh, between the elevations and the sections. The contractor had issued a request for interpretation and the architect answered it in a fairly timely manner, not as quick as it should have been. It took longer than it should have. Slowed progress up a little bit. Bad weather came. Um, that slowed overall progress. And in the end, uh, once an entire elevation of a two-story middle school was complete, the owner came out and looked at it and said, that's backwards. And lo and behold, it was. Uh, the architect had chosen the wrong of the two choices uh, as the one that he thought was the one the owner wanted. So that moved into a claim and moved into a dispute and through communication and through careful listening, uh, we discovered that the people in the community loved the elevation as it was built. And the people in the community were invited to uh, uh, unofficially have some communication with the school board members who said, well, what's wrong with the elevation? The answer is absolutely nothing. It's just the colors were reversed. It wasn't what the school board superintendent wanted, but it was what everybody that lived around the school loved. 
case closed. They left it just like it was. It's a beautiful school and everybody loves it. And only one person in that process, the official person with whom we were supposed to communicate, was at issue with the way it was installed. And the truth is, the superintendent didn't really care. In the end, he just thought that there had been another group that picked a set of colors and he had to stick with it. So the, the example I use there is to say, if you're listening, if you are listening, paying attention, carefully communicating, if you're being fair and impartial, then you're looking for mutually beneficial solutions. You can come out of a situation where everybody's right and nobody's wrong and things go well. Uh, so I just use that as an example of a case where that occurred for me. Uh, that was probably way too long for me to talk, but uh, Matthew, let's go to the next slide and see if there are any questions at this point. Yeah, we had a question and then we had a comment. So the question came in from Clint, uh, and he said, can the submittal schedule be used to help determine when the RFI needs to be addressed in the schedule? Often RFIs are related to submittals. Knowing when the answers are required in the schedule could provide better control of timing. Yeah, man, that is a great comment. And and I would think, yes, it could, especially if you've agreed to that uh, in the pre-construction phase to say, okay, we've got this schedule. It certainly is a great way to parcel out the responses that you're going to have to share and perhaps helps everybody focus on phases of the project. I think that's a great concept, and I think it could be, they could be tied together very appropriately. And then we had the comment came in here from Robert uh, saying with the A201 uh, 2017 edition, 4.2.7 states that shop drawings, product data, and samples, the architect's action will take place while allowing sufficient time in the architect's professional judgment to permit adequate review. This revision requires a review of the Division 01 days on submittals. RFIs are not identified in this article. Hmm. Well, thank you. Well, so I'm not going to read through this list, but we, we've talked about this. Uh, there is abuse, and there there are uh, those parties out there that use RFIs in these uh, ways. Just be aware and just be careful uh, to not get caught in that. Um, and And... Let's look at the next slide, Matthew. Uh, we've talked about this too uh, in, in how long you should take to reply. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're being careful, you're following your uh, general conditions, you're, you're using reasonable time, sufficient time uh, to professionally respond. Um, as I've talked about, you want to do it as soon as you can, as soon as you can professionally, uh, so that you reach the commitments that you've made, uh, but also uh, so that the momentum of the project uh, continues uh, uninterrupted. And so uh, we've talked about the responses. Let's look at the next page and, and the next slide. And how is it that we should respond? Well. It should be in writing. It should be prompt. It should be consistent with what our intent was, what is reasonably inferred from the contract documents. It should be clear and complete. Uh, when you do reply, it should include everything that you need to include. If there are drawings or sketches that are needed, then, then they should be a part of this. Uh, you should be referencing existing drawings uh, when it's appropriate. And uh, if, if more information than that is needed, then it should be included in the RFI. And if it is going to involve a change, then there should be a different process to reply, and that is a request for proposal. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a change in the work, and it's not just an interpretation, maybe it's a minor change, then there are other forms like uh, architect's supplementary instructions that might be used or that 
clarification notice that is the CSI form that might be used. Um, and then when the contractor determines that maybe that response is in fact changing something within the contract summertime, then they shouldn't proceed, of course, and they should come back with additional communication about uh, additional information for the project in a different form. So the, the next slide is a very interesting diagram of, uh, that's in the practice guide of how this information flows. And I'll just say about this slide, one of the things that we often do is use our language, our within the industry language with our clients. Uh, and often they don't understand when we're referring to some of the things that we just uh, take for granted. The practice guide has these diagrams in there to help with our owners. So I, I've sat with my book with clients to say, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me, you, let me show you who has to touch this information so that you can understand more clearly uh, what's at stake when we're uh, trying to respond to something. And I think these roadmaps, uh, although to some of us they may seem a little silly, uh, are very uh, useful tools in helping our clients understand what's involved, uh, why we're impartial, why we're uh, trying to uh, collect answers and get them back to the contractor as soon as possible. And the last slide in the series is just an example of an RFI log um, that you may see on projects. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of critical information here, but there are two columns that are most special to me. And one is, when did I receive the RFI? And the other is, when did we reply to the RFI? And as long as the numbers, as long as you do the math between those two, and it's a very small number, uh, most of the time, uh, these have been uh, good projects. When those numbers start to get large and you start putting in weeks instead of days, uh, that can lead to real trouble. And uh, thank you to BBH Design for letting me use their um, their submittal log here, sorry, their RFI log uh, as an example. I am so sorry to power through all of that so fast, and I want to see if there are any questions. Um, and of course, uh, please follow up with uh, this webinar through the questions, and Matthew will get those to us so we can look and reply if you didn't get a chance while we were on the call together. But Matthew, any any questions so far? Yeah, there was one more that came in here. Uh, so the design team members are required to visit the site to make observations during construction. In disputes, if the design team members do not take exception during the construction, can they take exception at the completed work? Whew. Well, I think it would be difficult. Um, I wish Doug were here to answer that, but I, I think it would be difficult. The if if you go back to some of the webinars we've had about site observations, when you see things that are non-conforming or defective work, it's critical to point that out right away, especially as it affects time and subsequent work. Uh, good work could go on top of bad, and if you don't point it out when you see it, um, then that can be a real problem for work down the road. So, But you are not perfect, and you can't see everything. Uh, I think the point is to be sure that you communicate in your official forms and procedures uh, anything that you see that's not compliant or that's not uh, being interpreted right or is not it is not consistent with the contract documents and uh, get that um, documented and get that communicated. Well, that looks to be the last question we had, and we are over the allotted hour. Uh, so I guess, Jim, if there's anything else you wanted to recap or else we can close off for today's session. 
I'll just say thanks for being with us, and I look forward to having you back in January when we move into the second part of Chapter 8, which are modifications. Thanks so much, everyone, for participating. It's always a joy.